Hello and welcome to Bonus Action Dash. My name is Jaren and this is Friday Night Game Chat. A segment of this channel which is really kind of just a hodgepodge of whatever topics on my mind that week, whatever I want to talk about. Uh, I know we are kind of in the middle of the one d and play test, so most likely over the next several months, however long it goes, I'll be giving some feedback and review on that and talk about uh you know my review and and why i why i agree or disagree with some of the changes but for tonight i originally had a different topic in mind and i kind of woke up this morning and decided a last minute change it um because it was a topic that i think needs a little bit more it's not that i didn't have it ready to go it's something that i'm really uh thinking a lot about these days and i think i can add a lot to the discussion it's the topic of uh, imposter syndrome and how to approach it, I think, in a, in a in a more in a more healthy sort of a way to do it. Um, but I I kind of realized I didn't want to do it in a live stream, even though I have the notes ready. I didn't want to do it in a live stream off the cuff and then end up forgetting some things because it is kind of a an important topic that I want to give enough weight to. So I will record that at some point. Probably won't be in a live stream, but it will be on the YouTube channel. You can find it. Uh, I am bonus action dash zero, the number zero on YouTube. And there's a link in the Twitch channel details. Um, so tonight instead, I'm talking about something a little more lighthearted. I'm talking about fixing cantrips. Yes, those things that are either your easy go-to picks or they're kind of trash. And uh, the thing is that when I was doing some research for this topic, it's something that I've wanted to talk about for a while too. The number of existing cantrips, it's not, there's not a whole lot of them. You look at D&D Beyond, there's three pages of cantrips. It's not like there's uh, an endless, you know, repository of, of uh, cantrips to choose from. So um, most of them are, I think, acceptable. And then there's a few outliers that are either extremely bad or they're the easy go-tos that everybody picks and they're kind of broken, um, and we've seen a little bit of WotC trying to fix those kind of broken ones in some recent uh, one D&D play tests, and I will address some of those. Tonight, I think I, I have five of the bad cantrips, and depending on how you count them, like maybe three or four of the pretty good cantrips, and I'll talk about how I'd change them to make them actually playable or make them not the always go-to pick, make them a little more interesting at least. Uh, and we're going to start off with the bad ones. And I do want to say, um, I think what we're going to see as a theme with these cantrips, they're probably a little bit more difficult to balance as, as being something that costs nothing. There's zero, they're, they're a zero level spell. They don't have a spell slot you got to burn. And if you've played any sort of competitive mechanical game um, that has resource management as part of its mechanics, for instance, I used to play quite a bit of Hearthstone, uh, Activision Blizzard's online uh, collectible card game, similar to Magic the Gathering, and I have a lot of friends that play Magic. If you've ever played something like that, you know that when things cost zero, when a card costs zero, when resources cost you nothing, um, and in D&D, when spells cost you nothing, they have at least the chance to be broken, at least the chance to be abused and push to their absolute limits so you really got to keep an eye on them and that's why they're a lot harder to balance because you you can't simply nerf a cantrip and call it a first level spell i think it's kind of the wrong direction so knowing that i think what we're going to see is either these cantrips are extremely efficient for what they do and they're too good or they just don't do enough for what they do but we can't simply change the casting cost make it a first level spell or or whatever so we have to come up with more creative ways on buffing these or bringing them back down in power level. So let me get started and make sure that I am clicking on the right thing here. Uh, no, we are off. Let's click over here first. First spell is Blade Ward. Uh, this amazing cantrip, just to refresh memory, is uh, it's in the... I'm pretty sure this is in the basic rules in the player's handbook. Uh, it's a casting time of one action and you extend your hand and trace a sigil of warding in the air until the end of your next turn you have resistance against bludgeoning piercing slashing damage dealt by weapon attacks so the problem here is you're giving up your entire action just to give yourself resistance it's kind of useless you could you'd usually want to do literally anything else 
to participate in combat. You know, for most for most characters, just using an unarmed strike is probably going to be more effective in the long run. Uh, but literally doing anything else besides just giving yourself resistance to damage is going to be a better option. Um, and like I said before, the problem is we can't just change the casting time because I think the effect isn't all that terrible. You know, it's got a neat effect, but I can't. We can't just change it to being a bonus attack or a bonus action. Sorry. Um, a bonus action because then everyone would take this and you just spam it every single turn and it'd be crazy good uh so that's part of uh, showing the example of like just because it's uh, you know it's a zero casting uh cost basically it's a cantrip changing making minor tweaks can really have some crazy effects so um my suggestion for blade ward i like the effect um but i think what we, we can do better so instead of my, my, my idea to change blade ward is instead of it being resistance, because I have other ideas for these spell actually called resistance. Um, I think what we could do, I like this idea of, uh, imagining my character cast blade ward and we draw this magic sigil in the air and suddenly we are protected from damage. And when blade strikes come in against us, they hit this invisible barrier. And instead of resistance, what if we're just straight up immune to? That seemed pretty strong, I thought, and maybe that's the wrong direction. Maybe that's a bit too much in that direction. So what if we were immune to those types of damages, the damage that would come from a blade? It is called Blade Ward, after all. Um, what if it gave us immunity as long as maybe some other requirement that was not, you know, something that we really wanted? It was sort of a downside. What if we said we get resistance or sorry, what if we got immunity to that damage provided we don't move more than five feet during the turn we cast it? The idea being we create this magical uh, force of, of you know, whatever present, prevents this damage, this invisible barrier that prevents damage from a blade. And we have to sort of duck underneath that. It's going to last us the turn and at least is going to protect us in some way rather than giving up our full action to just give ourselves resistance. I can't really think of a good situation where casting blade ward is going to get your party out of, out of a, out of a bind, right? I actually thought that would be kind of a neat, uh, mental exercise to come up with a situation where after you get out of that, you go, I'm sure glad I prepared blade ward. It's the thing that saved us from this fight. And I, I had to think, and it was, a real convoluted specific scenario where it was like, I'm going to take enough damage to kill me. I'm the last player standing. I have nothing else that I can do on this turn. I can't make it to an ally to give him a potion, but as long as I can prevent damage enough to stay alive one more turn and make it over to an ally, I can give them a healing potion and I'm going to cast blade ward to make sure that I still stay alive and I can start reviving some some of the healers of the party. Maybe that's the one situation where you'd rather cast Blade Ward than attack something or do literally anything else. Use your full action to dash and get over to your ally and be out of range. Maybe, maybe you can. Maybe you're surrounded by a bunch of enemies and they're all going to hit at you with swords and so you're like i cast blade ward to give myself resistance to damage um and that way i can survive the oncoming onslaught and start resurrecting some healers i don't know but the the way that you could actually use blade ward and it be useful is incredibly niche and specific and convoluted not really that something that's going to come up that often so I think it would be cool. This is my fix, my suggestion. Uh, let's change resistance to immunity to those specific types of damage, the damage that comes from blades, uh, bludgeoning, slashing, piercing, um, and make it some sort of restriction. Like I said, maybe maybe you have to stay within five feet of where you cast the spell because you're kind of like standing beneath this invisible barrier that's protecting you. So. That's my suggestion for Blade Ward. Right now it's trash. No one picks it for good reason. Let's move on. I talked about resistance because the next one on my list is the cantrip called resistance. Um, I don't know why 
why does this spell not do what it says it does? Uh, just to remind you what the text of resistance is, it's a concentration spell. Um, you touch one willing creature, cast, uh, cast in times one action, you touch one willing creature. Once before the spell ends, the target can roll a d4 and add the number rolled to one saving throw of its choice. The roll can be uh, either before or after making the saving throw, then the spell ends. So I know that they need to add that little caveat at the end that before or after making the saving throw, because one of the problems with this spell is unlike guidance and using it with ability checks, you often don't know when you're going to be asked to make those saving throws. You know, ability checks are like, I want to try to jump that, you know, that 10 foot uh, gap in the, in the floor. I want to try to jump over the pit or pick the lock or open the door, or check for traps or listen in on uh, somebody talking, see if I can hear what they're saying. Um, you know, those are proactive things. And unlike that, I know that the, the spell has to specify that you can do it before or after, um, just to make sure that you can actually get some use out of this. Uh, the problem though, is it's an, it's an action to do so. And there might be situations where not being able to react to a situation is, is, is a problem. Not being able to do it as a reaction might be a problem. Um, so I think my my solution to resistance, I wanted to just do what it says, right? Uh, I wanted to, I don't want a D4. I don't know why this has to be the opposite counterpart to guidance. Why can't it be its own thing? We have a, uh, a, a an ability, I guess you could call it, um, called resistance. It's a thing that exists in D&D &D that means a certain thing. So I'm I'm kind of confused as to why the spell called resistance doesn't just say give resistance. You know, you could even specify and say, like, you have to say what type of damage you gain resistance to. And that'd be fair. Um, but I don't want a D4. I want actual resistance. And I think um, we do need to keep a concentration, right? Because otherwise you're just spamming it on everybody. Uh, but I think that's that's the way that I would fix resistance anyways. Um, let's make it do what it says and we'll, we'll keep it as uh get rid of the d4 i don't want the d4 i just wanted i want i want uh you know to half that damage uh next up i also realize we're probably not going the full hour of the stream that's okay uh next up is the cantrip true strike possibly the worst cantrip in D D 5e just to remind you what true strike is because you probably have never seen this cast it's a concentration cantrip Cost one action. Uh, it's got a range of 30 feet. Uh, the components are somatic. So it's uh, simply, you know, using your hands to draw a sigil or whatever. Uh, spell text. You point a finger at a target in range. Your magic grants you a brief insight into the target's defenses. On your next turn, you gain advantage on your first attack roll against the target, provided this spell hasn't ended. Because it's concentration, you might have the spell ended by then. Um, so the problem is you're giving up your entire action. You're spending your action, which could be spent on an attack to give yourself advantage on the next attack. You know what's better than advantage over two turns? Two attacks. Two attacks might hit two crits, but advantage can only hit one crit. So I don't know why you would ever do this. It is the worst cantrip in 5e. It's so bad that sort of like uh, like the first one review, like Blade Ward, you'd literally rather do anything else. So when I said you'd rather do anything else with Blade Ward, anything besides True Strike is what I'm saying. And if you're thinking about casting True Strike, do anything except for Blade Ward, right? That's the only, only uh, caveats to that suggestion. Um, but yeah, the problem is you're giving up your entire action to give yourself advantage when literally just attacking twice is better. So this cantrip, which is concentration, is worse than just taking a normal a normal attack. Uh, so I think what would be really neat is I like this idea uh, that you could watch an enemy, uh, maybe they attack you, and you, as a reaction, instead of an action, as a reaction to them attacking you, you use the cantrip true strike. You still have to maintain maintain concentration, but you use this magic to gain a special 
insight to how they they attack or what their weaknesses might be you use your magic to kind of like kind of like spider-man you know where he slows down time and you can kind of see the enemy's hit coming in um or maybe you, you can even use your reaction to uh seeing an ally that's within five or ten feet being attacked and you use true strike and kind of notice where the enemy is striking how they swing their sword and how there's an opening right underneath the elbow and on your next turn as long as you still have the spell up then you get advantage that way you're not burning a full action i think if i could use my reaction my reaction to me being attacked or an ally that's within range being attacked um and maybe we need to specify that it is specifically weapon attacks and not magical attacks you know as long as that enemy was is within five feet uh, or 10 feet or something like that like i don't think you could use this to um notice an enemy's weaknesses that is like firing an arrow from 100 feet away or something but then how are you going to actually attack them i think this would have to specifically be melee attacks and melee attacks for yourself um you could see how an enemy moves how they strike how they uh what what openings they leave in their defenses as a reaction i might want to take this then that's kind of neat i i you know there's not a whole lot of things that use your reaction besides opportunity attacks and uh, maybe this would be one way to change that up a little bit and um give yourself some more options right because i i'm thinking now that yeah noticing an enemy attack that's close to you might provoke an opportunity attack but you know there's plenty of situations where you're hoping that they move away uh and they just don't and then you're left watching your friends get beat up and you just have to wait for your turn i think it'd be kind of neat if you could use your reaction give yourself more things to do with that reaction that's not opportunity attacks and then on your next turn you go in for the kill and uh, you have advantage i think that'd be one thing that'd be kind of neat uh next and we're kind of getting out of the range of uh what are the absolute garbage cantrips we're i'm now getting into a couple the last two on my list of five bad cantrips are kind of the ones that are maybe a little bit more niche maybe they just don't do enough um are not necessarily bad they're just the ones that you probably want to do something else so the first one in that category spare the dying awesome spell but it doesn't really do enough in my opinion um to refresh your memory for spare the dying this is a cantrip that says it's casting time is one action it's a range of touch so you got to actually touch the target um you touch a living creature that has zero hit points the creature becomes stable this spell has no effect on undead or constructs it basically means as a cantrip you walk up touch one of your friends that's dying and they stop making death saves uh, or if there's some narrative reason that you want to keep that enemy that you just killed alive, maybe you want to question them, you want to bring them back to life. So you go over and you spare the dying, and uh, now they're not going to die. You can probably bring them back up after the fight's over and start asking them questions. Um, those are kind of the only uses. But the problem here is, why would you take spare the dying when literally any other healing or potion does the same thing as an action i guess if you're light on potions sure this is kind of useful then just stock up on potions go buy healers kits there's so many ways and looking at the the uh the one D changes there's gonna be more ways that you can uh, just take the durable feet and you got healing basically um and maybe that wouldn't apply because that's kind of for yourself but you get the point there's so many ways to heal that aren't action spells right um i guess maybe the big problem here is that it's it, it costs your whole action to not really do much not be it's actually worse it's kind of worse than like any potion or any other healing any other healing is going to bring them back up to uh above zero and this just makes them not take death saves so um i guess the problem is here is just it's not it's not good enough you don't do enough and it costs your full action um it, it's hard for me to come up with a good way that this could possibly be useful because it's really riding that line of like there are so many other things that do the exact same thing but better 
that if I was to make this better, it's either going to be exactly in line and exactly as good as a healing potion or ridiculously good. Uh, so my attempt was to say, uh, what if instead of this being a full action, what if uh, instead it was a bonus action? And instead of walking over to your ally that's dying or the enemy that you want to question and spending your full turn, your full action to keep them from t making death saves uh, and not wasting your potions and maybe not bringing them up back to health, um, it's a bonus action. It gives you more things you could do with your bonus action because there's not that many. And um, that way you're not spending your full turn. You can walk over you know, bonus action, you snap your fingers or draw some sigil in the air. It's a verbal and somatic component, so you don't need to be carrying around some weird stuff or make sure that you got your component pouch. You walk over, you, you draw the thing in the air, you speak the words, and you bend down and touch your, your ally or the, the dying enemy. And then you actually do something with your turn that's actually useful. You know, that I don't know that I'd pick this cantrip then, but uh, it'd at least be you know, reasonably not useless. <laughs> it's, at least it wouldn't be total garbage. Uh, it might be something to pick in that case. Um, so, I don't know. I, that, one's, that one's kind of a challenge to fix. Uh, I don't know what I would do with it, but at least maybe if this is a bonus action, it might be somewhat useful. Uh, last one on the list is a spell that I actually really like. It's just way too niche it's a cool spell that i wish had more practical uses and that's the cantrip magic stone very cool spell just way too niche uh to remind you what magic stone does it's a bit of a longer one it's a bonus action cantrip uh verbal and somatic components it's uh ranges touch lasts for a minute not concentration um you touch up to three basically whatever stones you can pick up in your hand um you imbue them as, with magic uh, either you or anybody else can use these magical stones um you can use them to make a range spell attack either by chucking it or using a, a sling or something like that uh range is 60 feet and it is uh bludgeoning damage equal to d6 plus your spell casting modifier um and the spell's done once you use the stones. So what's uh, what's really cool about this is it, it's a cantrip that makes anything that you can find and pick up basically that is anything that resembles a stone. Which, no surprises in high fantasy D and D, stones are everywhere. You know, it's and now you have a magic weapon in, at, your, at your disposal. Um, what's great about this, this is and why I'm putting this on this list is because I'm playing in a campaign right now as a ranger where the entire party's in prison in caves in this cave-like system of prisons. We had all our gear taken away. And uh, all I'm thinking right now is, man, I wish I had magic stone prepared because this is the one time that this would be extremely useful because I'm a, I'm a ranger. I shoot with a longbow and my strength is seven. I can't even punch for damage. But if I had magic stone, boy, would it be on because, uh, I mean, we're in a, in a prison that's in a cave. So like stones are everywhere. I could just, uh, and it's a verbal and somatic component. So I don't need material. I don't need my things. Uh, I just utter some words, draw some sigils in the air. I wave my fingers and I've got magic rocks. I got weapons, um, that isn't based on my strength. Super cool. It's based on my spellcasting modifier. Um, so why this is on this list is because I wish it was better. It's so cool. The problem is it's way too damn niche. It's pretty much never useful except for this one scenario in my current campaign, which I've never really seen. This hasn't really come up where I'm like, man, I wish I had something that was a magic weapon right now. I, you know, when are you in D and D without your gear, without all of your weapons or in a situation where you can't go get something easily, it's pretty rare. Um, at least in my games and in the games that I've played. So that, that's the problem with the spell. It's super cool. It's just way too niche because we're just never really without our weapons. Um, here's my fix for this. 
it's tough because it's a cool spell. It's great effect. We, I don't think making the casting time any faster, it's a bonus action to begin with. Um, making it a reaction does nothing. Making it an action does nothing. Change, changing the damage doesn't really you know, change its effectiveness. It's effective because if you're ever without weapons, you have a weapon because stones are everywhere. Uh, what I would do is... I think this would be re a really neat cantrip if it was a class feature for rangers and druids. I like this idea that you are so connected to nature that you can simply touch a stone and suddenly it's going to hit harder. Maybe not a class feature, maybe it's just a spell that at first level you always have prepared. That way I don't have to spend, it's just something that I know, I know how to do this. I know how to make rocks really hardy and magical. Um, maybe we change uh, druids and rangers so that you just you can pick one of these cool naturey fey kind of spells, cantrips, as your you know first level always prepared spell. Um, and magic stone could be one of those things. It's just it's too niche to make me pick it right now. But if I had it always, if it was a class spell that I just had. Yeah, I'd be glad to have it. And uh, there's lots of situations where it would come up useful. Not when I have my my longbow and I have a plus 11 to hit, but when I have a 7 strength and I don't have my weapons, I oddly find myself in the current situation, in my current campaign, going, man, I wish I had Magic Stone prepared because that could actually be really cool and useful so that's my suggestion for fixing for, for a fix for this one is maybe make it a class feature or just give it as a first level spell that druids and rangers always have prepared so that wraps up my bad cantrips now let's talk about some good ones and how i would bring them into uh maybe not be so spammable i guess um as i mentioned at the start of the stream part of the challenge of balancing cantrips i would imagine is since they cost zero, you can just spam them all the time, provided you meet the cantrips requirements. Uh, and we've already seen, I'm glad that WotC is aware of this, we've already seen their attempt to bring one of those maybe back a little bit less spammable. Uh, so they're aware of this problem. I'm assuming that they were aware of this anyways. Uh, and we saw this in the most recent 1D&D playtest, which whenever these changes go live, it's not going to be for a while. We've got a lot of time to think about it and talk about it, but we see that they're at least aware of it when they tried to fix the spell guidance. That's on the next on my list. Um, where one of the proposed changes that they made was instead of this being an action to cast, I think it's an action right now. Um, they, yeah, action to cast. They changed it to a reaction which you take to seeing one of your allies within 30 feet fail at ability check. Uh, also, the range changed to 30 feet, so you no longer have to go up and touch somebody. Um, still has the same effect of being able to add a D4 to that ability check. The big change here is you can only benefit from the effects of this once per long rest. And by the way, these are just proposed changes. This isn't changes right now to 5e. These are just proposed changes that we know that they're aware of, but I, I don't really like this direction of saying um, that a creature can only benefit from guidance once per long rest. And, I, and I'm fully aware that the other thing that they added into this is it's a reaction to somebody failing. So you're never giving guidance to somebody that is going to succeed anyways. It's always at least going to be theoretically useful. But I, I dislike the idea that this cantrip that we all know and love, that's so iconic, is limited by another character. It's limited by their using it, not me using it. And I dislike that direction. Um, I, I am aware, I have seen games, I've played in games, where any time there was an ability check, it was somebody shouting guidance. And um, you know I, I am aware that that can be kind of frustrating for Dungeon Masters trying to balance you know, a dungeon crawl and uh, traps and all this stuff. Um, you know, but that said, I don't think anybody's going 
man, my campaign was going great until guidance started getting spammed. Then it went completely off the rails. This isn't campaign ruining stuff here. It's just, it's making your uh, your DCs a little bit less relevant, I suppose. But at the end of the day, it's just a D4. So uh, the problem here, like obviously everybody getting guidance, you get guidance and you get guidance and we all get guidance because it's super easy to spam. There's no material component. It's just, you can just spam it left and right. Um, my I had two ideas that I think are at least better than Watsi's approach of restricting it based on uses, usage, uh, uses by the character and saying you can only use this once per day. You can only benefit from guidance once per day. Uh, my first proposed fix is what if, and this is going to be kind of out there, what if this was the first cantrip that had a material component with a gold value attached, right? And not a big one because this is a cantrip. First level characters are getting guidance. We don't want to, uh, you know, de-incentivize using guidance and saying, well, you know, this thing costs 10 gold worth of materials. And so you only get to use it once because you only have 10 gold because you spent it on gear. Um, but what if it was something small? Not something that's going to be punishing, but something that makes you think twice before spamming guidance 20 times in a day. You know, maybe it was like, you know, uh, you got to spend two gold worth of gold dust or something like that. Um, I like this idea that, you know, hey, you are uh, calling upon the gods. This is a divinity cantrip. Uh, calling upon the gods to see if they can come down and change the course of reality itself. If they can put their divine influence into the world and shift it one way or the other. Uh, and that's going to cost you something. It's, you know, going to cost, you know, maybe, maybe in this example, two gold worth of gold powder, uh, just as an example. Um, why I think this might not be a good direction is because while it does solve the spam problem, I think this might be a bit too harsh for low level characters who usually don't have a whole lot of gold anyways, and maybe not taxing enough on higher level characters who, you know, let's face it, at a certain point in D&D, who cares about gold? You know, you're sitting there and looking at your inventory going, well, I have 5,000 gold. Um, I can buy whatever I want because I'm level 15 and money is kind of meaningless. Uh, if I'm not buying it, I'm trading for it or I'm going and killing gods, you know? Uh, so I think it might be too harsh at low levels, not harsh enough at higher levels. Uh, if it was a gold component requirement. Uh, so my fix number two suggestion, I think this might be a little bit better, is still rolling with this idea that you are calling upon the divine powers at B to come and influence reality uh, to give your friend a D4. What if there was a check associated with even getting that D4 to begin with? You know, you have to make a check to see if you actually have a connection with your with your divine in this moment to come down and influence reality. And maybe it was, if if it was that case, it's not a D4. Maybe it's D6. You know, you have to see, you have to make a uh, like a religion check or a charisma check or some kind of check when you cast guidance to see if you have that connection in this moment for your God to come down and help your friend. You know, I think that'd be kind of cool. Maybe it's too much dice rolling. Maybe, I don't know. I like rolling dice and seeing if the if the thing happens. Um, and I think that makes sense thematically for what the spell is doing. And I think another cool side effect of doing doing it this way, of having you make a religion check or charisma check with your, with your I don't know, religion modifier, uh, would be, since this would mean that guidance doesn't go off every single time, and you can still spam it all you want, it just isn't going to happen every single time, um, what this might do is maybe a side effect is it makes bardic inspiration feel a little bit cooler since that's kind of similar. And I know that bardic inspiration scales, whereas, uh, guidance doesn't, um, but you know, I I'm trying to, as best as I can, apples to apples here and say that like, you know, yeah, of course, uh, a class feature that scales with level is going to be better than a cantrip. Obviously I'm not trying to say that, well, yeah, bardic inspiration is so much better. Obviously it is. Um, but whereas in this example, guidance doesn't happen every time bardic inspiration on the other hand does happen every time. 
that's guaranteed to add that dice to your check. And maybe that makes it feel a little more cool in that case. I don't know. But that's, I think that would be my suggestion for fixing it rather than saying, uh, you, you only get to benefit from guidance once per long rest and you can only do it when someone fails, you know, that I don't, I don't think that feels good to me. Um, maybe you gotta make a check to see if somebody even gets guidance. I don't know. Uh, next on the list, I'm kind of coupling, uh, two together. I think on this next one, I don't remember what's next on the list. Uh, yes, I think this might be the last one. So we're probably not going more than uh, another five minutes or so on this stream in particular, but, uh, that is the two cantrips, Eldritch Blast and Firebolt. And, uh, I am fully aware with the one D&D play tests, it seems to me that Eldritch Blast in the next iteration of D&D, in the next edition, Eldritch Blast isn't going to be a cantrip that other classes can choose, but will be a Warlock class ability, which seems like a pretty obvious uh, obvious move. And it's like, why didn't they do that before? Um, but I just thought it would be really kind of fun to take a look at this, uh, this cantrip and pretend that we were in a world where that wasn't moving to a class feature for a second. And I'm putting Firebolt with this as well, because, um, I mean, they're, they're both D10 cantrips. They're both D10 damaging cantrips. And I thought it was kind of amusing that, well, while no one, uh, well, well, a lot of people complain about Eldritch Blast being super strong. Maybe it's because there's a class that has features that make it better and Firebolt doesn't. Uh, I never heard anybody complaining about Firebolt, but that's besides the point. Um, so one of my ideas for Eldritch Blast and uh, Firebolt, obviously like the, the one D&D fix is a really good one and it's one that we should have seen coming a long time ago. Uh, but one of, an idea that I, I like and this is sort of inspired by my Hearthstone experience. I'm sure Magic of the Gathering and other card games like that have a similar concept. But I like this idea specifically for uh, Eldritch Blast because it is something that is has this demonic sort of origin. Um, I like this idea that maybe we are allowed to have really strong cantrips that have like a self-damaging sort of a drawback. Like, yeah, you can do D10 damage or D12 damage, but every time you do, it's going to deal damage to you as well. Um, and that might, I, I think that's, that's a cool idea. It, it was really inspired by my Hearthstone experience. There's a few cards that are similar to that that are overpowered for their cost, but they've got this big drawback of damaging yourself. Um, I thought as a cantrip for like a first level character that might be a bit much, right? You don't want to, uh, I don't know what that damage would be. I'm just uh, kind of making it up, but let's say that, you know, you, you cast uh you cast Eldritch Blast for a D 10 and you're a first level warlock that has, you know, 12 hit points. And all of a sudden you have to take eight points of damage because of that or whatever it is, even four points of damage with 12 points, uh, 12 HP max is a good chunk of your HP and it's really going to make you not want to cast Eldritch Blast. Um, so maybe instead of like a flat dice roll for, for self damage, uh, we had cantrips that were like this that self damage, but it was um, scaled either by like your current level or your current hit point. So like at level one, it was, you know, maybe not a D4, but maybe a flat one point of damage. And as you leveled up that, that damage increased you know, similar to how, like, you know, as you level up, you have more spell slots. Maybe as you level up and get to do these type of cantrips, it does more and more damage. And, or maybe it was like a percentage of your current hit points so that your spells like this would never kill you, but they would just, you know, maybe deal a percentage of your hit points as, as you leveled up, as your, your current hit points, uh, increased, you know, it did 10% of your current hit points so that, you know, if you've got a hundred hit points max and you're already down to 20, you're not taking a big chunk of damage. You're taking 10% of that two hit points, not a big deal, but it's still a penalty, you know? Um, so that that's, and this would apply to, you know, also Firebolt, which is sort of the same idea as Eldritch Blast. It is, um, 
you know, it's a, uh, a cantrip that does D10 worth of damage and it does scale as you level up. So it, ha- it kind of has a similar feel to Eldritch Blast. Um, maybe we should be allowed to have these and it's totally fine. And maybe, maybe something even stronger than this, but it has sort of a self damaging effect. Uh, that's just my, my ideas is kind of off the top of the head. I think at the end of the day though, uh, these cantrips are probably fine. It's good to have some that are a bit stronger than others. Um, and I realize that it's a challenge to balance cantrips because of their zero cost. And they're usually going to fall sort of in the middle range where they're, you know, the utility spells do cool things. Prestidigitation and Druidcraft and Thaumaturgy, really cool spells and Minor Illusion, uh, great cantrips that aren't game breaking and do cool stuff. And the things that deal damage are probably going to deal, you know, either a D8 or a D6 plus something else. And that's fine. They're going to have some small effects. Um, I, I just think that like guidance shouldn't be changed the way it is. And uh, maybe we can, you know, make some of these lower uh, unused horrible cantrips, you know, the blade wards of the world and the true strikes of the world actually useful. If you didn't have to spend your full action to do it. If true strike was a reaction, if a uh, blade ward actually gave you immunity to certain damage and if resistance actually gave you resistance maybe we might pick them i don't know uh that's my ideas let me know what you think i'm gonna have this up on youtube very soon i will not be back here on sunday for regular DD prep uh because we have got a couple players out we'll be taking a week off that'll give me some time to get caught up on putting my stuff up on youtube again links down in the uh twitch channel description uh, and about it is bonus action dash zero, the number zero on YouTube. And uh, I think that's about it for tonight. Thank you for sticking around. And I will see you back here again next Friday night, 9 p.m. Central for more late night game chat. Thanks. See you then.